Hello everyone, and welcome back to our series on sorting algorithms. Today we're going to be talking about insertion sort. This is a fairly simple sorting algorithm which will segue perfectly into next week's discussion on shell sort. So without further ado, let's just jump right into it. We can define insertion sort as a simple comparison-based sorting algorithm which splits the list into a sorted and unsorted sublist. We then take elements from the unsorted portion of the list and place them at their correct position in the sorted portion. Oftentimes when computer scientists talk about insertion sort, they will use the example of sorting a deck of cards. You start with a completely unsorted deck, and then slowly position the cards at their correct position. Say you start out with a king. We can place it anywhere since it's the first card in the sorted portion of the deck. Then let's say next you pull a 4. Well, obviously, a 4 goes before a king, and so we put that in front of the king. Then, say we get a 2. That goes in front of the 4, and so we can slot it in at the front of the deck. Now, let's say next we get a 3. Well, a 3 goes after the 2, but before the 4, so we can sort of just make room and slot it in there between the 2. Now, as much as our ad rates would love it if I went on into the entire 52 card deck, I think you get the idea. We take a card and slot it in where it belongs. That's pretty much the main idea behind insertion sort. We take an element from the unsorted part of the list and slot it in where it belongs in the sorted part of the list. Of course, saying one thing is easier than actually doing it, and to actually do it, we need pseudocode. Now the first thing to note about insertion sort is that we pass in two variables into the function. The first is the array which we want to sort which as always I'll call R, short for array. The second is the size of that array, which I'll call R size. The first thing that we want to do once we enter the pseudocode is immediately jump into a for loop. This for loop will take us from I equals one, while I is less than the size of the list, R size, and increment I by one each time we iterate through the loop. You might be wondering why we start at 1, since array indexing usually starts at 0. But don't worry, this will be explained later. Essentially, what this outer for loop will do is take us from the second index location all the way through to the end of the list. Now once we enter the loop, the first thing that we're going to do is create two variables. The first I'll call key. Key will be an integer which stores the value of the element at the index location i. So on the first run through, it'll store the element at index location one. The second time through, it will store the element at index location two, and so on. The second variable that we create will be another integer called j. This will be an indexing variable, which is equal to i minus one. So on the first pass through, it will be zero, then one, two, three, and so on. This is the reason that we start indexing i at 1 in the outer loop, because j will start at 0. Now, here comes the insertion part. It might seem a little bit overwhelming at first, but I'm going to go through the whole process first and then retrace back and explain it. Okay, so while j is greater than or equal to 0, and the element at index location j is greater than the key element, we place the element that's at index location j at index location j plus 1. This essentially moves the element at j up 1. Then we decrement j. Finally, after our while loop has concluded, we set the element at index location j plus 1 to be equal to the key element that we stored way back at the beginning of the for loop. That right there is the entirety of insertion sort, but that last part might be a little bit confusing, so let's break it down. Now the reason why we set the element at index location j plus 1 equal to the element at index location j is essentially to make room for the key element. The entire purpose of this inner while loop here is to move elements that are greater than the key element to one position ahead of their current position. Once we find an element that is less than the key element, or we hit 0, we know that that's the index location that we need to place the key element at and that's what the last part of our code does. Once we find the suitable place for the key element, which is evidenced by us exiting the inner while loop, we place the key element at the index location right above it. 
This will put the key element in its correct place in the list, similarly to how the playing card ended up at its correct place in the sorted deck. Now that's actually the complete pseudocode for insertion sort. Now, let's go over an example sort and then take a look at how the algorithm works on a large scale in the visualizer. So, to begin, let's pull up a list of eight elements unsorted. Then, let's initialize our first indexing variable i, which will set equal to one. Notice how it's now marked on the array as a visual aid. Next, we initialize our other two integer variables. The first is going to be key, or the element that's at index location i. In this case, the element at index i is 2. The second is going to be j, which, remember, is just i minus 1, or in this case, 0. Notice how now it's marked on the array as a visual aid. We're now ready to enter our while loop. We check the element at index location j, or 8, and compare it to the key element, which is 2. Since 8 is greater than 2, we enter our while loop and set the element above the index location j to be the element that's at index location j. This replaces 2 with 8 in our list. Our final step here in the while loop is to decrement j. Since j at this point is negative 1, that means it fails the first condition of our while loop, which is that j is greater than or equal to 0, and so we do not enter the while loop again. Now that our while loop has concluded, our final step in this first iteration is to set the element at index location j plus 1, or 0, to be equal to the key integer, which is 2. After all of that work, what we've essentially done is swap 2 and 8. 2 and 8 are now in the sorted part of the sublist, meaning if we were to take just those two elements and look at them, they are technically in sorted order. Now we just need to make that statement true for the rest of the elements in the unsorted sublist. And to do that, we go all the way back to our outer for loop and increment i, which makes it 2. We restore the key integer to be the element at index location i, which is 7, and we restore the j integer to be i minus 1, or 1, and then we enter the while loop and compare values. The element at index location j, or 8, is greater than the key element 7, and so we set the element just above j to be equal to j. Now, we decrement j so that it's now 0, and check again. This time, the element at index location j, 2, is not greater than the key element 7, and so we exit out of the while loop once again. We replace the element at index location j plus 1 with 7, which completes our second iteration through this for loop. As you can see, our sorted sublist now contains the integers 2, 7, and 8. Going back to the start of the loop, we increment i again, making it 3. Then, we store the new key integer as the element at index location i, which coincidentally is also 3, and finally, set j as i minus 1, which makes it 2. Testing the while loop, we compare the element at index location j, or 8, with the key element 3. Since 8 is greater than 3, we set the element that's just above the index location j to be equal to the element at index location j. And then we decrement j, making it 1. Now, the element at index location j, 7, is still greater than the key element 3, and so we set the element that's just above index location j to be equal to the element at index location j, and then decrement j once again to be 0. Finally, the element at index location j, 2, is less than the key element 3, and so we can finally break out of the while loop and set the element at index location j plus 1, to be equal to the key element 3. This increases the size of our sorted sublist to 4. Again, we go all the way back to the beginning of our for loop and increment i once more, making it 4. This means that key becomes the element at index location 4, which is 5, and j becomes 4 minus 1, 
which is 3. Comparing values, we can see that the element at index location j, or 8, is greater than the key element 5, and therefore we set the element just above index location j to be equal to index location j. Decrementing j makes it 2, and we compare elements again. Again, the element at index location j, 7, is greater than the key element 5, and so we set the element that's just above j equal to j once more. We then decrement j again, making it 1. The next time we check values though, we can see that the element at index location j, or 3, is less than the key element 5, and so we break out of the while loop. And again, our final step is to set the element at index location j plus 1 equal to the key element 5. Going back to the beginning, i gets incremented to 5, key gets set to the element at index location 5, which is 1, and j gets set to i minus 1, which is 4. Going through our while loop, we can start speeding things up a little. The j element, 8, is greater than 1, and so we set our values and decrease j. 7 is greater than 1, and so we set that value and decrease j. 5 is greater than 1, and so we set our value and decrease j. 3 is greater than 1, and so we set our value and decrease j. 2 is greater than 1 as well, so we set our final value and decrement j one more time. Now, j is less than 0, which triggers the first condition of our while loop. This causes us to exit out of the while loop and set the element at index location j plus 1, or index location 0, equal to the key element 1. You'll notice that each time we place an element at its correct position, it's taking longer and longer. This is because we need to compare it to a larger and larger sorted sublist in order to find its correct location. You'll see how this can become a detriment later on when we talk about time complexity, but for now we've still got two elements left to sort, and they're not going to do them themselves. We increment i which makes it 6. Then key becomes the element at index location 6, which is coincidentally 6, and j simply becomes 6 minus 1, or 5. Comparing elements, the element at index location j, or 8, is greater than the key element 6, and so we set the element just above j to be equal to j, and then decrement j. Again, the element at index location j, or 7, is greater than 6, and so we again set the element just above j to be equal to j, and then decrement j. Finally, the element at index location j, 5, is less than the key element, and so we break out of the while loop, and then we can set our index location j plus 1 to be equal to the key element. We only have one more element now, so just hang in there. We increment i so that it becomes 7. Key becomes the element at index location 7, which is 4, and j becomes 7 minus 1, which is 6. The element at index location j, 8, is greater than the key element 4, and so we set our values accordingly, and then decrement j. Again, the element at index location j, 7, is greater than 4, and so we set our values and decrement j. The next time through, the element at j, 6, is still greater than 4, so we set our values and decrement j. Then, the element at j, or 5, is greater than 4, so we set our values and decrement j. And finally, the element at j, or 3, is not greater than 4, and so we set the element at index location j plus 1 to be equal to the key element 4. And just like that, we have successfully sorted our list of 8 elements using insertion sort. As you can probably tell, the longer that it went on, the more tedious that it got. But luckily for us, the computer will be able to perform the comparisons and swaps way faster than we ever can. Speaking of the computer, as is tradition, now let's blow things up to massive proportions and look at things through the visualizer. If we run the algorithm on a large set of data, you'll notice that pretty quickly there forms a clear divide between the unsorted part of the list and the sorted part of the list. Then, while it's too fast for you to see, 
Each element gets its turn being the key and going through the sorted part of the list until it's found its correct place. You'll also notice that the longer that the algorithm goes on, the slower it appears to be moving. This is because the more elements that enter the sorted sublist, the more comparisons that we need to make in order to find the correct placement for that element. Now if we go into a smaller data set really quickly and slow things down, you might be able to see each individual color making its way through the sorted data set before being placed. Sick. We've now got a pretty thorough understanding of how the algorithm works on both a small and large scale. So next, we're going to go over insertion sorts time complexity equations. Insertion sort starts out pretty strong with an O of n best case scenario time complexity equation. That is to say, if we are given a sorted list, the algorithm will simply run over the array once, see that everything's already insorted into its rightful place, and then exit the function accordingly. Unlike, say, a merge sort or a quick sort, where we do a bunch of stuff even if gifted a sorted list from the computer science gods, insertion sort has the unique quality of recognizing that a list is sorted and exiting out accordingly. Unfortunately, that is the only praise insertion sort will get in this department. Its average and worst case scenario time complexity equations are both O of n squared, which is extremely inefficient compared to the other algorithms out there. The reason that things are so rough in this department is because for each element that we insert into the sorted part of the list, we have to compare it to each element that it passes over. That is a hell of a lot of comparisons, which over time adds up to produce O of n squared time complexity equation. In addition to this, and as you may have already guessed, insertion sort also has a worst case scenario space complexity equation of O of 1. This is simply because there is no need to allocate any extraneous memory as insertion sort is an in-place algorithm. Now you might be thinking to yourself, Stephen, this algorithm seems pretty terrible. There's no way that this gets any use in computer science. And well, you're partially right. Now as a general purpose sorting algorithm, you're not going to use insertion sort. There are way better and way faster algorithms out there that we've already covered such as quick sort, merge sort, etc, etc. Where insertion sort excels at, however, is in specific certain situations. Let me explain. Insertion sort is good in cases where the data is being added to an already sorted data set, or when the problem size is very small. The first makes sense. If the data is already sorted, and then say we want to add 10 elements, we only need to place those 10 elements at the correct place in the list. There's no need to call 50,000 recursive subcalls of a merge sort or implement a heap sorting algorithm. A good example of this might be if you have a database of alphabetically sorted usernames and then somebody makes a new account. You could simply use insertion sort to place the name at its correct place alphabetically in the list. You don't need anything fancy like a quick sort or a merge sort for this. Insertion sort will work just fine. The second case is a little bit more abstract. Basically, insertion sort is used a lot when the problem size is very small. It might seem like a hard example, but there is actually one in regards to an algorithm that we haven't talked about yet, known as bucket sort. We actually use insertion sort in the process of bucket sort. And this might seem a little bit weird, using a sorting algorithm within a sorting algorithm. But I promise, once we get to bucket sort, you'll understand. I guess you'll just have to subscribe and stay tuned for that video to eventually come out. Either way, while you may have thought a simple algorithm like this doesn't get much use, you'd be sorely mistaken. Insertion sort still finds its way into the nooks and crannies of the computer science world. And with that, we have concluded our discussion on insertion sort. As a review, we can define insertion sort as a simple sorting algorithm which splits the list into a sorted and unsorted sublist. We then take elements from the unsorted position of the list and place them at their correct position in the sorted list. Next week, we'll talk about another type of insertion sort known as shell sort. If you haven't checked out the other videos in this series, I'd highly recommend you do so to get caught up. And make sure you subscribe while you're at it. With all that being said, thank you for watching.